This week's episode of EWA Radio is sponsored by South by Southwest EDU. EWA retains full editorial control over the content of this podcast. This is EWA Radio, the official podcast of the Education Writers Association, and I'm public editor Emily Richmond. If you're a journalist who's feeling burned out or ready for a change, a professional fellowship can be a fantastic opportunity to recharge and renew your passion for your work. It can also be a chance to broaden your horizons, deepen your skill set, and widen your network. What makes a great application? What should you expect from your fellowship year? And how can you boost your chances of grabbing that brass ring? Joining us today are two experienced journalists with firsthand knowledge of how to answer those important questions. Jalise Smith-Barrow is the education editor for Politico and was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan. Jalise, welcome back to WA Radio. Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me on. Also joining us is a veteran education writer and editor, Sarah Carr. She was a Spencer Education Fellow at Columbia University and was recently named the new director of that program. She will officially take the reins from the inimitable Linnell Hancock in July. Sarah was also an O'Brien Fellow at Marquette University in Milwaukee in their fellowship program for public service journalism. Sarah, so glad to have you back. Thanks so much, Emily. It's great to be here. Delise, I want to start with you. Tell us a little bit about where you were professionally and personally when you decided, okay, I'm going to apply for a fellowship, and that would have been the winter of 2016? Yep, because my fellowship year started September of 2016. But I had, at the time that I was applying, I had been a full-time higher education beat reporter for roughly three years. I had been a professional journalist for maybe eight or so years, maybe nine years. And I think at that point when it was, when I was applying and figuring out the next steps in my career, I was really wanting to take a close look at an area of education coverage that I felt like deserved more attention. I think a lot of times when you're a beat reporter, you are turning it out and you're turning out good stories, but you don't necessarily have the time or maybe the resources or the means to take a step back, do extensive research, extensive interviews, just kind of, you know, be absorbed into a topic that could really help students or families, um, policymakers, anyone. So at that point, when I was applying, I had been covering higher education with a focus on graduate schools. I was looking at law schools, medical schools, business schools. It gave me a really good window into the labor market and how schools would pivot to introduce new majors or degrees to kind of meet the market demand. And I found it really interesting, but I got more and more into how schools were diversifying their leadership, and especially if they were committed to drawing a diverse pool of applicants, educating a diverse group of students. A lot of times it, you know, all went back to, well, who's running the school? Who's teaching the students? Who, you know, is in the administration? And so when I applied for the Knight Wallace Fellowship at the University of Michigan, I ended up getting it, which was great. And then I studied how um, top tier research universities, um, all the efforts that they were making to diversify their staff. And I looked at Michigan, of course, since I was there, but also got to look at Miami University in Ohio and just got kind of like different universities across the U.S. to get a really broad, full perspective. And because I had plans to return to my newsroom after the fellowship, it was great because I could use some of the sources that I developed, some of the research that I came across in my stories as a beat reporter when I went back, I guess, in fall of 2017. One of the things we should mention about the Knight Wallace Fellowship that is unique in a lot of ways, well, first of all, it's a residential fellowship. You need to move to Ann Arbor. And there is an expectation that you're going to immerse yourself in a project and take advantage of as many of the academic opportunities that are there. You can take almost any class that you want to take, which is a way to sort of get back into the classroom. And I imagine that that itself was pretty invigorating. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, as an education reporter, 
you love school. You love being in classrooms. You love hearing about new subjects, new topics. So getting the opportunity to sign up for any class I want was pretty sweet. And then you get to take these classes without the pressure of homework or exams or, you know, anything like that. Like you're learning for the sake of learning from really smart people. So I really jumped at that opportunity. And one thing that was difficult for me to do as a beat reporter, because you are, you know, working so much, I didn't actually have that much time to spend in the classroom, which I know might sound kind of weird to be covering education, but not necessarily be in the classroom. But so much reporting can take place through, you know, interviewing people over the phone or reading through a policy brief, you know, things of that nature. So whenever I did get a chance to be on someone's campus, I was just really excited. So to spend an entire academic year on a campus was just a dream. Sarah, I want to talk for now a moment about the Spencer Education Fellowship. And what's very different about that when you compare it to some of the other fellowships out there is that you come in with a pretty specific project of what you want to do. When you were a Spencer Fellow, you reported on the explosion of charter schools in New Orleans, the massive growth there. And that led you to your book, Hope Against Hope, about New Orleans schools post-Hurricane Katrina, which came out in 2013? Yes, that's right. When you went into the Spencer Fellowship, that was a couple of years before that, were you expecting to go into it and come out with a book project? I was, but I think I was an oddity in that regard. I had actually, I think when my application was still pending there, I found out that I um, had sold my book to an editor, which um, had some pros and cons. <laughs> um, I, I had a really clear kind of mandate going into the fellowship of really reporting out this book that I had sold. But I think it also gave me a little bit less flexibility than a lot of fellows who've done it and who've been a little less sure of whether they want to do a book or what the final output might look like. And I definitely really appreciated and learned a lot from the resources and kind of fellowship of the other fellows and the mentors I had at Columbia. But I also wish I kind of could have done it all and taken advantage of that and, and sat in on more classes like Delise did. It seems to me like it's a great example of do you see your glasses half full with the book contract or do you see it half empty as I wonder what I might have done if I didn't know already going into this, if there had been more time for exploration. I really think that kind of Monday morning quarterbacking, you know, sorry to mix metaphors, folks. I know the metaphor police are going to send me a ticket shortly, but there's there's so many ways to look at that. But I mean, your book is terrific. And I, for one, am glad that you had the time to sort of dig into that. Talk to us a little bit about the mentors that come with the Spencer Education Fellowship, because I do think that is something that the program really stands alone. You know, a lot of other programs will assign you a faculty person to sort of advise you about the classes you might take, but it is much more intensive and much more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship that can build at Columbia. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, when I did it, which was in ancient Spencer history, <laughs> uh, many, many years ago, there were two mentors that were automatically assigned or, or could pick. One was located in the journalism school and, and focused more on the journalistic aspects, but you could also get a, a subject content area mentor. And I think since then, they've even expanded the mentoring and Columbia embedded support. And you might be able to speak to that more than I can, Emily, having done a Spencer Fellowship more recently. But one other thing that I really appreciated, and this is kind of front-end application stage mentoring about that fellowship and some others as well, is that they really encourage you to reach out with your idea and run it by the director and staff or board members and get feedback on it. And, and I think for a lot of people who are trying to gauge whether this is the right fit and if they think it is, how they can have the most sellable proposal. That's a really unique opportunity to get feedback before sending off the application. You're right, Sarah. We did bury the lead a little bit. I was fortunate enough to spend the past academic year on a Spencer Fellowship, and absolutely the mentors were essential. You know, having a topical mentor in the history department and then having a journalism advisor it was really a game changer for me. And that's something that I really treasured. But Delise, again, um, and 
this is where I start to sound greedy. I was also a Knight Wallace fellow ancient history ago, you know, more than a decade ago for the 2010-2011 academic year. And while it wasn't formalized, I certainly built some professional relationships there that have persisted to this day. And I bet you did too. Oh, for sure. I am regularly in touch with my fellow fellows from other classes like yourself, Emily. But the network is definitely one of the biggest gifts that Knight Wallace gives you. You spend a lot of time getting to know the people in your cohort, but also there are several opportunities to get to meet the class that came before you, get to meet the people who are interviewing for the next class. Um, we just had a big reunion where you know several classes came together and gathered in Ann Arbor. So I really appreciated that if I did have questions um, about my career or something else, I had this wide network of people from Ann Arbor to Brazil to London to say, hey, can you help me with this? Or do you know an editor at this news outlet who could possibly look at this pitch or you know something else? But the network is outstanding. I don't want to get too deep into this episode without mentioning some of the other journalism fellowships that are out there. We may not have someone represented on this podcast, but are still tremendous opportunities and have certainly been home to some fantastic education journalists in recent years. That includes the Neiman Fellowship at Harvard University, Chastity Pratt, who is the education editor for the Wall Street Journal. She was a Neiman Fellow, the John S. Knight Fellowship at Stanford University, there are also some smaller scale opportunities, including the Center for Health Journalism at the University of Southern California. They've supported a number of really superb education-focused projects in recent years. And the Institute for Citizens and Scholars Media Fellowships. We encourage our listeners to take a look at all of those opportunities and to give them your full consideration. I'm curious, Sarah, when you think now about sort of taking charge of the fellowship that you had, I mean, I know there'll be some changes that will come, but Looking ahead, what would you recommend to folks who are thinking about their application? What makes a strong application for the Spencer? I think, um, and I think this would also hold true for the O'Brien Fellowship at Marquette, which we haven't really touched on. But I think those two fellowships are really project driven in that they're looking for a really compelling idea and evidence that you're the person to do it. I think that there's a, a balancing act to be struck in that some applications maybe are too general and are a topic, but don't really show that they have a sense of story. So I think you want to give some indication of how this topic can be turned into stories without being too rigid, without being like, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z story, and they'll be this long and publish at this date at this publication. So it's finding that balance between specifics, but also showing you're kind of open and ready and eager to be shaped by the resources that will be available as part of the fellowship. When I look at the O'Brien Fellowship, one of the things that stands out to me is how sort of embedded in the DNA of that opportunity is working with graduate students. And that's something that you can do as a Knight Wallace Fellow, or you could do as a Neiman, or frankly, as a Spencer Education Fellow, but you need to kind of build that in yourself or cultivate those opportunities versus the O'Brien, there's an expectation. Is that a fair way to sum that up? Yeah. As part of the O'Brien, you are assigned student interns doing journalism work at Marquette. And they work alongside of you. And I, I think it's like, it's a really great opportunity for people who are interested in teaching, maybe to get some sense of that. Um, but also just for people who maybe who don't have an interest in teaching, but just value kind of being a mentor. And it's played out in really different ways. There are fellow intern pairs who've reported their projects side by side and co-bylined. In my case, the two interns who I worked with who were both fantastic ended up doing their own piece out of Mississippi and they kind of got thrown into it because in the end I couldn't go on that reporting trip to Mississippi with them and they it was one where they really, really executed it on their own. But I think a lot of journalists, maybe not all, but I think most just value having partners in the work. And the nice part about that is they just brought a lot of young person's energy <laughs> um, to my project and to just my, my daily reality, which was nice. 
We're talking with education editors Jalise Smith-Barrow and Sarah Carr about opportunities for career-changing journalism fellowships. This episode of EWA Radio is sponsored by South by Southwest EDU. Join them March 4th through 7th, 2024 in Austin, Texas, as they tackle the world's most critical social issues through the lens of education. Experience community-driven programming, unparalleled networking opportunities, and unexpected discoveries. Visit southbysouthwestedu.com to discover hundreds of sessions and events already revealed, featuring inspiring thought leaders in education. Register today. Delise, what would you say to someone who's saying, okay, I'm listening to this. I'm not sure I'm ready to make this big leap. What should they be weighing? What are some of the questions they should be asking themselves about whether now is the time to apply for a fellowship? I think that if you're weighing whether or not now is the time to apply, I would think about what do you want your career to look like in the short term and in the long term? Because I know for me personally, I had like both plans. I knew I was going to return to my newsroom, but I also knew that I wanted to get into a different area of education eventually, you know, hopefully sooner than later. Um, And essentially that's what happened. Like I returned to work. And then a few months later, I found a job at a nonprofit where I was on a completely different pace. I went from filing a few stories a week to a story like once every other month because it was like a deeper, slightly more investigative piece. So I think you have to kind of weigh like, what will this fellowship do for me? Like if I were to get it, is it to improve my skills and apply it to my newsroom? Do I want to get new skills and then take it to another newsroom that's a better fit for my interest in journalism at that time? you know, thinking about like, what do you want the next step to be? And also you want to make sure you're not looking to do a fellowship because you want to hide from journalism. I think some people get the impression that they want to just take a year to kind of do nothing. And it's really the opposite. Like you want to be taking a year to do something really unique, to really take advantage of these like once in a lifetime opportunities that are being given to you to really advance yourself in various ways So you want to make sure it's not just about like, I don't want to go into work tomorrow. You want to make sure it's like, I have a passion project. There's a story that I've been dying to look into, but I haven't had the opportunity or a beat that I'm considering, you know, changing to, but it's like, who has time to research a new beat? You know, maybe you could in this type of setting. So I think figuring out like how this fits into your longer career plan is critical before you fill out any application or reach out to any directors to learn more information. That's great. And Sarah, I would love for you to add to that. I echo everything that Delise said. And I also feel like the flip side to the people who might be looking for a way to hide from journalism, as she put it, is it's maybe not the best fit for somebody who's spent seven years doing a really long-term in-depth project and wants kind of that final funding to finish it off. I've heard directors say they're a little bit wary of those applications where it seems like they're just kind of the final check in a long-standing budget. And so it's finding that middle ground and having something that where you have have done some research and invested some time and know there's a really amazing story or stories there but also just making the case that this work really wouldn't get done if you didn't get this fellowship. Looking back, both of the fellowships I've done, like I've just been at an inflection point in my career where just something wasn't quite right. And I wasn't sure what I needed or wanted to do, but in very different ways, the two fellowship experiences helped me sort through at least some of that. I can remember the tension in my newsroom when I was applying for the Knight Wallace, you know, talking it over with an editor back in 2009 at a time of a recession. You know, it was a very difficult conversation. I ended up getting terrific support from my newsroom, but that was a tough conversation to broach. Will you hold my spot for me and will I be able to come back? And I'm wondering what advice do you have for reporters, Sarah, who may bring this to an editor who might be less than enthusiastic about, you know, quote unquote, letting a reporter take a leave of absence. Any tips on that conversation? Yeah. You don't want to say things like promise things that you can't deliver. But I think going into it with the framing of 
if, especially if you know that they're really going to be hesitant in your ability to apply hinges on their blessing, like just what's thinking through what's in it for them. And that could be as simple as what the work you're going to produce will run or error at that news outlet, but it could also get you some real skills that will be useful when you return to that job. I mean, this is this is sort of a <laughs> a little bit like speaks to the state of the industry. But I, I know a lot of people who've gotten the blessing of their supervisors or editors partly because of they want to save money and won't have to pay that journalist's paycheck, and so that can also be part of the equation and part of what might also be in it for them. And another thing to think about is that some of the fellowships have different options in terms of how full-time or part-time they are and whether you're residential or not. The Spencer one, for instance, there are two very distinct tracks there, one of which is full-time and is expected to be mostly residential and the other, which comes with a much um, significantly smaller stipend, is non-residential. And there are people who've used that as a part-time option and continued to file stories for their news outlets. So that's something else to think about. You know, Maybe you can't sell it as a full-time thing, but could commit to do a certain number of stories and do the part-time fellowship option. This is one of the most difficult questions to answer when I get asked this question about the fellowship on weighing that risk. And it's the same answer that when people used to call me at my desk at the Las Vegas Sun and say, tell me which is the best school, which is the best school. And I'd say, I don't have an answer for you because I don't know your child. And the answer is going to be very different for everyone. So I would say to, to folks out there, think carefully about it, discuss it with the people who are closest to you, take advice with a grain of salt. I don't always say trust your gut, but this is one of those times where you're going to have to make a pros and cons list and weigh those opportunities. Julius, I'm wondering, was there anything that you sort of unexpected that you took away from the fellowship that you think about sometimes that surprised you, something that you had an opportunity to do or see? Well, there were so many things that surprised me, to be clear. I was really impressed that Michigan offered this really rich hip hop class and that I learned so much about this genre of music that I thought I knew and realized I actually really don't know. So that was really cool. And I think one thing about the Knight Wallace Fellowship is that you travel with your fellows, with the fellowship director. And I think, you know, having grown up in the United States and done some travel, I didn't truly realize how much of the world did not revolve around the United States. We went to Brazil during our second semester and we spent most of that time in Sao Paulo. And I think it just amazed me at how like big and bustling the city was. Um, when you grow up in the United States, you really think, oh, New York is kind of like the biggest, most bustling city. But we were in, in Sao Paulo, which kind of was like another level to me of busy and bustling. And I felt similarly during our fall semester when we went to South Korea and things were just, it felt like we were on another planet because things were so technologically advanced. I know that, you know, I think Vegas is the city that never sleeps. And I felt like that was nothing compared to where we were in Korea, where everything was open at three in the morning, the grocery store, like all kinds of like random things. So I think it was important for me as a journalist, you know, fast forwarding some seven years later really thinking about how global our economy is, the importance of being able to look outside your own community and really figure out like, how does this impact education? Like, do kids know about what's happening beyond their backyard, beyond their state? Do legislative officials know? And if they don't know, like, what are they missing? But I always think about how much my mind expanded during that time. And I feel like it's given me so much of a sharper perspective as a reporter, especially now that I'm at a national outlet, which has a ton of coverage overseas. I feel like I actually have something to offer and that I'm not just kind of sitting there um, trying to figure things out. I feel like I just know so much more about world affairs that can help me in my job today. 
You know, I can remember standing on the roof of the newspaper building in Sao Paulo, one of the tallest buildings in the city, and waiting for the sun to set. And when you turned in any direction, north, south, east, west, you would see spread out in front of you the equivalent of another New York City in terms of population. And it was just staggering. And I don't think anything can really prepare you for that. I do want to say we, we've talked about some of the the really great things that can happen with this fellowship. I do think it's important to remember that the reality of it, I mean, hundreds of people are going to apply for these spots. A few dozen people are going to get that happy phone call. I want to make sure that we share some other ways that journalists can renew, recharge, boost their skills, even on a smaller scale. So Sarah, what suggestions do you have for folks that are looking for that maybe more of an open door than you would see with the fellowships? It's important to remember there's a lot of smaller fellowships also. I mean, the ones that have been the focus of our conversation are full academic year, fairly full salaried professional opportunities, but there's many that may be more short in duration or maybe are giving you an extra resource boost for a specific story or are focused on bringing together kind of professionals around a a certain topic. I mean, the EWA has a lot of resources from diving into data to some of the, the topical groups that have worked together in recent years. And Emily, you might know better than I if there's some sort of registry of journalism fellowships that people could check out. But I also want to add that there's just, there are other things that might not bear the name of fellowship, but can give you some related elements. I feel like there's, I see a bigger array of like training programs, like people interested in being editors, like Pointer and ProPublica have those. There's And there's just a lot more collaboration happening than there was 10 years ago. And like formal journalism collaborations were really different. News outlets work together, ProPublica working with local partners on stories, you name it. And sometimes that can be really helpful in terms of giving you the chance to learn a new skill set or try a different story or just recharge your batteries by talking regularly with people at a different outlet. So I would think about some of those things. I just want to, before we end, just also suggest that people who feel like they want to do the fellowship route really take some time to really investigate the differences between the fellowships because they can be really substantial, not only in terms of who they're looking for and what you'll be doing, but just nitty gritty things like whether they offer health insurance. Those are really important things to know. And most former fellows are really kind of open to talking about their experience. So I'd encourage people not to be shy about reaching out to people who've done the fellowship to get their sense of how it worked. That's great advice, Sarah. Delise, any words of advice? Yeah, I agree with everything that Sarah said. I've done a couple of pointer programs to continue to learn and grow my skills. I also think that a lot of the journalism affinity groups offer workshops, trainings, things of that nature. I know the National Association for Black Journalists, example, has a political task force, and it helps journalists covering politics get sources or, you know, figure out like the ins and outs of Congress. They have sessions about this. Earlier in my career, I went to a lot of trainings with the Online News Association. I was a web producer, so um, I found it very valuable to figure out ways to be better at my job or just to think differently about how journalism could be displayed. So I think, you know, beyond the fellowship, which is a essentially, you know, nine month or so commitment with a lot of these places, you could be getting training for a day or a week or a weekend at a lot of journalism organizations. I can also say some other things to keep in mind are the IW Wells Society has their sort of intensive boot camp program, IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors, does trainings as well. There have been some you know, fantastic opportunities and programs, of course, through EWA, and we'd be more than happy to see everyone who's listening to this podcast join us in Las Vegas for our 77th National Seminar. We're going to be there May 30th to June 2nd, and we'll have quite a few hands-on workshop sessions and deep dives. That's another way. But you know, thinking about self-care and mental health, if there's something you want to do for yourself doesn't have to be a fellowship. Sign up for an online meditation class. Try yoga. 
look at the local college or university, find an evening class or a daytime class that you want to audit. Go to your editor and say, hey, I want to learn a foreign language, or I want to deepen my skills in this particular area, or I'm curious about the history and the business of sports, and this graduate school has a class and I can audit it. There are a lot of different ways you can advocate for yourself to boost and sharpen those skills that won't necessarily require some of the commitment of a fellowship or require somebody else saying, yes, you can do this. I want to thank both of our guests for making time today for EWA Radio. I know that their candid answers will be a big help to folks out there who are listening and are thinking about potential fellowship opportunities. Sarah Carr, thank you. Thanks so much, Emily, and thanks for having us on. And Dougie smith Barrow, we're very grateful to have had you here as well. Always great to be here. Happy to come back anytime. And that wraps up another episode for us. If there's a story or reporter you want to know more about, drop us a line at radio at ewa.org. The mission of the Education Writers Association is to strengthen the community of education journalists and improve the quality of education coverage. For more than 75 years, EWA has helped reporters get the story right. Have a great week, take good care of yourselves, and thank you for listening.